I am Jim Collison, and this is Gallup's Called to Coach, recorded on August 17th, 2021. Call the Coach is a resource for those who want to help others discover and use their strengths. We have Gallup experts and independent strengths coaches share tactics, insights, and strategies to help coaches maximize the talent of individuals, teams, and organizations around the world. If you're listening live, love to have you join us in our chat room. And many of you have. appreciate you doing that. Uh, there's a link right above me on the live page. Just click it and sign in with your Google account. If you're listening after the fact, we'd love to have you send us those emails, uh, coaching at gallup.com. And don't forget... To subscribe on your favorite podcast app or right there on YouTube, just hit the subscribe button. You'll, you'll get notified whenever we publish anything new. Laura Everest is our guest today. Laura is a Gallup certified strengths coach and an international best-selling author with more than 30 years of experience beginning at Harrods London. She spent more than a decade leading large teams. She has a successful track record for building talent and elevating business leaders and teams across diverse professional groups, market sectors, and cultures around the world. Laura, welcome to Call the Coach. Thank you so much for inviting me. So great to have you today. Let's spend a minute, like I think people introduce themselves the best. And so let's get the best of you. Two minute elevator pitch. Give us a little bit of your background, a little bit more than I just read. Okay, so I spent, as you said, more than a decade at Harrods leading large teams, developing teams, and I've spent many, many years as a leadership consultant and a strengths coach. Anyway, the point is, I thought I'd nailed it, and I knew exactly what it took for people to thrive in life, until unfortunately, eight years ago in Dubai, which is where I live, I had a horrendous accident. Um, in my spare time, I'm a runner, and I was out running one morning, I was hit by a car, thrown 30 feet. My feet came off, I separated my hamstring, I lost my lower arm, fractured my wrist, dislocated all my fingers, fractured my back. My mother always said, if you're gonna do something, do it properly, <laughs> and I really did. And the point is that, uh, you know, when I went into hospital, um, there was thought of amputation, and they said I'd never walk again. And I started working when I came out of the high dependency ward. I gave my first training in a wheelchair, completely bound uh, to 80 merchandisers, 11 weeks after my accident. And over the last eight years, I've now had 17 surgeries so far. I've got more to go, which is why I'm back in UK. Um, and, you know, I'm rebuilt with titanium. But the point is, what it really taught me was that we are so, so much stronger than we ever realize that we can be. And I think, you know, when we talk about the fact of strengths, it is so easy to just be accepting in who you are and what you do and not realize the honestly, the power of what you're capable of doing if you really want to. And I learned absolutely that resilience and what it takes to thrive is not a quick fix. It's not a bounce back, but it is a strategic process. And I'm not the least bit strategic thinking. I'm influencing and then executing. Um, but I've realized that it, you, there is still a way in which to understand how you tap into you know, your, your strengths in the best way and to recognize where they go when you're in a really emotionally hijacked place um, and use that very powerfully to come back. And that's why I do what I do now, because I've realized how incredible it is if you leverage your strengths in the right way. Laura, I think you hear a story like this and I, 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 it's interesting the way when you phrase your injuries, you're like, my feet came off, which like they literally did, right? I mean, it, it, it was a terrible, it was a, hor a horrific accident for you. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes when we tell these stories, um, it's easy to get, we, we've gotten past that point and we try to sell, we try to sell it as like, but everything's great right now. H how much pain are you in like right now is as, as we record this today? You know, the doctors always say on a pain level of, of one to 10, where are you at today? And and how much of it is pretty, is, is, is around all the time for you? Oh, at the moment, it's not too bad, but it's constant. Yeah. It, you know, if, or, you know, or I think I'm sitting down and I'm thinking, oh, okay, pain's not bad. 
And then I stand up and I think, oh, God, I can't walk properly. My legs don't want to move. It takes a bit of time to get things moving again. I think that, you know, you can, anybody who's listening, who's had pain on a longer term, you'll recognize that you actually, your your pain level changes a bit because you become used to the pain. Um, but I have learned very much to distract myself from it. I mean, uh, you know, I think a lot depends on your strengths. I think, you know, I was mentioning that my husband has deliberative as top strengths and his pain is very much mitigate risk, sit very still, don't move and pray it'll go away. Um, whereas, you know, I have maximizer, I have achiever, I have focus, I have activator. They're all things that say, come on, keep going, make things happen. So I'm forever working in my circle of influence to think, what can I do to manage, to cope, to get around it? Um, but strength, uh, you know, strengths are fabulous. But at night, you know, you can't do a lot. It is painful and you have to find ways just to suck it up sometimes, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. that's today. Let's go back to, to the accident, to the time, to the surgeries, to that, maybe that six month window right after it happened. How how does one think about like you know you're talking about we're talking about resiliency today and we're talking about bouncing back from that but you're in constant pain you're in constant surgeries how do you approach your your strengths from that person or how how did they work for you from that perspective I think what's really really important actually is you know I think anybody who's listening today who may be a strengths coach or know your strengths the thing is we know how to leverage them when we are feeling great. But when you are emotionally hijacked, there's actually, you know what you should do, but rationality just goes out of the window. And it's very, very hard to reach for the strengths when you're having a really difficult lost time. You know, there was an occasion, uh, you know, I'd had several surgeries. I'd had an ankle replacement that had gone wrong. At, well, it hadn't gone wrong, but it wasn't healing. And the surgeon was trying to fix it. And I was been hooked up to a lot of antibiotics on a drip in hospital. I came out and two days afterwards, my father, perfectly fit, center of my universe, just suddenly died. Mm. And honestly, I, I think that I was just, I just, everything went and I just was at my lowest possible point. And I think, you know, at that that stage, you know, you've got these strengths, you know that you can do things, but it's very, very hard to reach them when you're in that situation. And so what I realized is that, and, and probably this is why I say resilience is a strategy, because you it, over time, you have to work on what what happens best for you but the reality is you know whether we like it or not our you know obviously our thoughts feelings and behaviors are connected so the first thing I have to do is to kind of say what am I feeling right now we often talk about stressed or fine and they're just all catchment words but it was really important that I got clear on exactly what was the emotion I was feeling what was it doing to me how was I reacting how was I behaving and then only when I could address that first, could I say, you know what? I don't want this feeling. What would I prefer to feel? I need to feel that. OK, what have I done in the past when I felt like this? That helped me get there. And right. OK, that's what I did. What strengths were I was I using? All right. How do I do that? So it really is, you know, to get there, you have to find a way to bridge that gap. And it's because the pain just, it physical and mental pain just washes away all the logical things that you normally do, yeah. you know, when you feel great. And that was really important was to take it right the way back and, and really acknowledge and accept where you are right now and say, okay, here's where I am now. How can I deal with this step by step by step? You, you say, you've said, and in all the conversations we've had, you've used this word hijacked. And it, is that what you mean by that? It, when the when the pains, and it's not just the pain, it's pain over time also, that when it's every day, when it's consistently there, is that what you're talking about in, in the sense that we sometimes when we're struggling and, and when we're suffering, we lose the ability of reason to this, it, it it sounds good. Yeah, I'm going to tap into some maximizer. But the ability to do that when you're struggling, is that what you mean by that? 
Yeah, completely. So, so really, you know, we all know that when we're upset, our mind goes to different places. We we don't think logically anymore. We fall into familiar patterns of unhelpful thinking. We have this inner voice that tells us, oh, life is terrible, life is awful, you feel terrible, and it pulls us down. And it's just how do we cope with that? What do we do to kind of get over that? And it's not a jump in, oh, here's my strength, let's grab it. It really is being able to go back and recognize where you are and figure out a process. And I think the other thing that I found that was so, so important is to have a purpose or, you know, people talk about your purpose, your why, et cetera. But the thing is, in a, it, it really matters. Um, you need a goal. You need to have an, an end vision that of something that matters to you that you really want to achieve. Because for me, it was like an invisible rope that I kind of held on to that even though I felt terrible and I couldn't connect to the things I loved, I thought, there's a process, there's a reason why I'm doing it, and just, just do it one thing, little bit, step by step by step. And somewhere eventually you get back on track to where you want to be. So it was really, really important for me to have this goal, this insight somewhere, yeah. whatever it might be, and then just have little, little strategies that you know work for you, that you just put yourself in until you feel back into a place where you think, OK, I can cope now. What do I do next? So it was very important. Laura, you talk a little bit about the physical struggle, but certainly there's an emotional struggle in this. Does that does that formula? I mean, physically, I can I can set goals to say, OK, to, you know, over the next couple of weeks, I want to I want, I'm going to exercise or I'm going to do therapy to get to this kind of condition. How were you emotionally in this? Just thinking about the the pure emotions on the inside, and and, and where did that put you um, as far as an emotional state? Well, you know, it is really it is so easy to allow your catastrophic thoughts to take over, especially when you're in pain. But the reality is they don't they don't help. All it does is serve to make you feel worse than ever. So you've mm -hmm. got to find a way all of our strengths will kind of give us a slightly different perspective for me you know as I said I have focus and I have achiever and they were paramount for me to kind of say keep looking at what you can do what can you do what can you do don't sit as a victim because ultimately everyone gets fed up with you and the only person that's still struggling is you so it was anything I could think of that I could do to help myself through to stop it the catastrophic thoughts and say stop it just concentrate what you're doing here and now. Let tomorrow worry about tomorrow. Just deal with little things at a time. And I actually used to keep um, a, what I call Stephen Covey talked about, a victory list. So every time I achieved something that worked for me, I wrote it, wrote it, not just typed it, wrote it on a piece of paper. And I kept looking at that. So when I had a bad day, I thought, ah, but I know I can do this and this and I've achieved so much. And it really helped to motivate me when I felt in a really low place. There's some a question in the chat, word, or in the chat room. I think you used the word uh, catchment in something. You, did you say that? What, what, did, what, do you, what do you mean by that? Sorry, repeat that. Uh, what do you mean catchment? catchment? Did you say, did you use the word catchment? Um, uh, Jasmine was saying, uh, what's, uh, here, I'll throw that up. What's catchment words? Maybe maybe she misunderstood. Oh, okay. Sorry, uh, things. Um, well, I guess uh, catastrophic, definitely. But I think that you know we can use a word like we feel stressed mm. or I'm fine. What does that really mean? They, they're a catch-all phrase, but they don't actually tell you anything. You know what uh. is stress? Are we? You know how are we stressed? How are we feeling because of that? When we say I'm fine. Obviously, we're not fine. Fine weather is fine. What do we really mean by that? You know, are we sad? Are we grieving? Are we angry? Are we frustrated? You've got to really get clear on what those things are because you can't actually change your feeling until you understand what it is and you accept it and acknowledge it. And it, sometimes we don't want to do that. You know, it's horrible being vulnerable. It's horrible feeling things and we don't often take the time to analyze what that means for us but it's really important you get to know it mm. and say 
I'm in this space. This is what I'm feeling right now. And this is what it's doing to me. And only then can you say, "Uh -uh, I don't like this feeling. So what can I do differently that might help me get out of it? So I can what I hear you saying, a key to resiliency or to being resilient is to identify, is to get a layer below those emotions. So in other words, I'm stressed, but why am I stressed? What specific is causing this? And then what actions can I take to alleviate it? What happens when you can't though? You know, you're, you're just in pain. It's yep. just there. It just happens. What kind of strategies do you use to get past that? I think, you know, the first thing, as I said, there was this time when as a, when my father died and I, I did everything on automatic pilot. I was in plaster, on crutches, trying to help my family manage everything, feeling terrible myself, but just doing. And about two weeks after everything, you know, the funeral had been done, I had a complete meltdown. I just felt like I could sit at the bottom of a swimming pool and just sit there and walk. And honestly, I think we, when you feel that, you actually don't have to allow it because you can't, if you try to block pain or stop it or try to pretend it's not happening, it's going to come out later. It's going to come out in different ways and it's going to be worse. So sometimes you've got to allow yourself to really feel it and give yourself permission to say, I don't feel all right. And I am allowed to be sorry for myself. I'm a, I am allowed to scream and shout and cry and throw things or whatever we need to do first. And then when we've given ourselves permission and we've kind of got out that worst of it in a way, then we can say, okay, I've done that, but now what? Where am I going now? And then you find your little tiny steps of things you can do that it's like sitting at the bottom of a pool and pushing yourself slowly back up. But you've got to allow yourself that awful time because we have to grieve. We have to be sad. We've got to get it out before we can move forwards. As you're working with people now in this state, like you, you, you have the, you've been through it. Now you have the ability to coach. What, what it's, what, what's like the, if you were to help coaches help people, who are really suffering and, and physically or emotionally, I think, and, and maybe those are, well, let me ask you this question. Is there a, cause you've probably done both. Is there a difference between physically struggling or physically, um, you know, being in physical pain and being in emotional pain? Are those the same things or are those different? I think when you are in physical pain, it, it can, it does affect you emotionally in that pain, you're feeling the pain. It can make you, some people feel I have to, because I'm feeling bad, I need to make sure other people know I'm in pain and I might be unnecessarily unkind or difficult to work with, or I may find it very difficult to share or to open up or, you know, it affects us in different ways. So I don't think you can separate them necessarily because I think physical pain does affect the way you think it takes over you know um and you know you yes a tablet or two may help but the meds themselves if, mm -hmm. if you or others have been on medication you also know how awful that makes you feel so it is constant it is a mental pressure the whole time and you you've got to look at how it makes you feel and what then say what can my strengths do to help me with this do i need people around me who can lift me up um do i need time out on my own i have a friend who's very very high um in empathy and struggles with i need people around me but oh my god i'm absorbing their energy and it's killing me so it's really being able to understand getting the person to understand what what do you need to feel at your best what what do you need and how are you using that to help you when you're in pain because pain is it is it's completely debilitating yeah, I like that. What do you need <laughs> at this moment? Like in mm -hmm. slowing down, I, you know, um, I, I think it gives us a good opportunity sometimes to take a second <laughs> and just live in the moment. Like, okay, what is actually happening? I think oftentimes we get in that either emotional or physical crisis and we, we just, we're all, all we're doing is just responding. You know, it's, it's mm -hmm. fight or flight, right? In that moment. Yep. And sometimes it's okay. Okay, I think we just got to sit in the moment and be like, okay, what's going on right now? <laughs> like, what is actually happening uh, uh, to me? What kind of advice? Okay, let me get back to that other question then, as I derailed myself on that. W what kind of advice would you give to coaches who are working with people who are suffering in these areas? I mean, they they obviously have a debilitating, suffering something that's happening to them. 
knowing what you know and as a coach and both going through it, what kind of advice would you give to coaches who may be coaching it, someone in this? Yeah, well, I think, you know, as I said, we're very good. I mean, I, you know, maybe because I'm maximizer as well. The first thing I want to say to people is look at your strengths. What, you know, look at your successes, past successes. Let's push you into your strengths. But honestly, when people are emotionally struggling, you actually have to take it back. And you've got to actually look at when you when your strengths have really gone into their dark side, when you're really hitting the basement of where you are, what what happens then? you know, and really look at, at how that affects you, how that affects their thinking, the way that, you know, the behaviors, everything, and, and actually look at the weakness of it all first, and then say, right, when we can address, when we've got here first, only then can we start to put the steps in to say, all right, how do we move this forward? How do we go back now and look at past successes? What helped me? You can't do that till you've gone all the way around the clock, and you have to work backwards. So you've got to go into where they're feeling right now, which is that difficult dark basement you know of your strengths uh feeling awful and you've got to acknowledge that first and what it's doing and where the triggers are and then and then turn it back mm. so you, you can't reach for strengths you had both physical calamity as well as an emotional calamity with your father passing away it, it, i hope it's okay to ask this but what which where was where was the worst for you like when do you feel like or do you know like when you hit bottom and what did you do at that point? Oh God. Well, I, you know, I am, I have positivity in my top 10 as well. And I am, you know, I constantly work within, you know, what can I do? How can I manage? What, what options do I have? How can I be proactive? So for me to actually hit the basement where I just, I just remember a day where I thought I can't. My life is over. I, I just can't do anything. I'm in physical pain. I'm in mental pain. I don't want to think. I don't want to do. Um, and I remember my husband saying, what, 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 what's happened to you? And I just let rip. I said, I can't cope. I can't do. I can't think. And it was a horrible feeling. But you know what? You have to get down to that point sometimes. And you've got to admit it. And you've got to feel terrible. You give yourself that opportunity to feel terrible. You're allowed. And then, as I said, I just went into, uh, I don't know what I did exactly. I think I cried a lot and I wanted to be on my own. And, and then afterwards, you know, that time where you feel spent, you've done it all, you feel exhausted and you just kind of feel empty. Then after a bit, you can start saying, OK, all right, so I'm here now. What do I want? Well, how do I want to feel? How can I start moving forwards what kind of things might help me what things do i usually look for when i want to feel better what have i done in the past that made me feel better when i was at a low point and you start bit by bit by bit and you build something and then gradually you know what why do i want to feel better that's really important if you have no motivation to feel better you're not going to so why do i want to why does it matter to me that i do feel better what am i trying to achieve and then you start your strengths then align with that. OK, how am I going to do it? Well, when I've done this before, this has helped me. Let's try that now. And it's not about taking gigantic leaps. It's tiny, little, quick wins that just help you until bit by bit by bit, those wins get a bit better and a bit better. And suddenly you feel more in control again. And it is this is why resilience is a strategy. You can't. It's not a quick fix. And as far as I'm concerned, there's absolutely no bounce when you hit down that bottom. There's no, you know, quick positive thinking and wow, boom, I'm back up again. It is sometimes it's clawing your way back, but it is a process and it is very, very possible because I've had to do this 17 times. Um, and it is a procedure that you know what works for you and you keep applying your strategies mm -hmm. over and over and over. Mm -hmm. It's almost for, for me, I equate it with flipping a switch. In other words, you're, you're in this emotional moment uh, and you, you make a decision <laughs> you're like, and, and you have almost some awareness. I think the key to resiliency is having this awareness that, you know what, <laughs> I'm here, <laughs> I have arrived and I'm not, this is just where I'm at today. And I'm going to make some choices to do something different. Like I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm going to choose Nate said this in the 
chat room. He just said, he goes, notice, uh, notice all the questions. She's constantly engaging the logical part of her brain to move out of the emotions. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think there's a lot to that. As you think about your top five, top 10, and the themes, somebody had asked earlier if it how, you know where belief is for you. It, but it, it prompts me to ask you the question, when you're in those moments and you're flipping that switch, what are you, for you personally, what are you, what are you using to get that emotional switch flipped, so to speak? Oh, for me, very much, I dig into my focus. My, my, key, mm. my key way of thinking is, what am I trying to achieve? What it, oh, my cheaper as well, there you go. What is it I'm trying to do here? What do I want to see? And I have that vision in my head of where I want to be. And then I say, okay, so what do I need to do? What steps can I take to put in place to get me to that? So really for me, my, you know, my focus, my achiever work very, very hard. My ranger, I'm always looking for a different way. My maximizer, how can I do it better? You know, and this is where it's great. I mean, on the other hand, when I was stuck in a wheelchair for five months, honestly, you know, my, I was going spare. It, it killed me because I'm, I'm not somebody who, who sits around for very long. You probably guess I have huge energy and it was the most terrible, terrible time for me. I really felt grumpy and awful. And I had to use every bit of my focus to think, what can I do to help myself here? What can I do? What can I do? Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, um, you know, you can see where they work both yeah, ways. Yeah. I, I just don't think you can move forward until you've recognized the spot you're currently Correct. in. Right. Correct. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I tell you, you know, one thing uh, where I learned how powerful those strengths can be. Um, so after my father had died, for example, um, I was working uh, at the time for one of the premier training companies in Dubai as a consultant for them. And it was a, a training company. And they also you know, used to do events. And as it so happened, um, you know, I happened to be musical and I used to help them with some of the musical events that they used to do. And they phoned me from UK. I was, I was thinking, you know, I, my father, you know, I was thinking of heading back to Dubai and I, I was sad to be leaving my family. I was in pain physically. I was grieving. And the company phoned and said, we're in such a dreadful space. We feel terrible, but we've got this big event coming up the day after the morning after you arrive in Dubai um, and it's not in Dubai, it's outside Dubai. And it's, for, I think it was for about 70 or 80 people. And it's this large singing event and you're the only one that can do it. And we hate to ask you. And I remember thinking, no, I can't possibly do it. I, I, I'm just not ready. But I have responsibility sitting at number six and responsibility said to me, oh, oh you can't let people down. So I said, yes. And my family said, you're mad, completely mad. And I cried and thought, I'm mad, I'm mad. But I got out to Dubai and the following morning, somebody collected me from my company because I was on crutches mm -hmm. in a cast, drove me the two hours to where this event was. And quite honestly, to get a crowd of people who have had a, a great night the night before, to get them on a Saturday morning or Friday morning, because that's our weekend, to come and sing and dance at 8.30 in the morning. You know, that's quite a challenge, <laughs> even if you're feeling great. Yeah. Okay, so now there I am on the stage with my big cast and my crutches. And I thought, oh my days, what am I gonna do? But in actual fact, my focus, right? My, straight away it's got to happen what do I need to do and do you know what I didn't just do a good job I did an amazing job and they were really the, the clients were amazed they loved it and at the end of that I thought it just shows you when you really channel your strengths to everything you've got into where you need to go it just shows you the power and it was fabulous for me because it showed me that you know what what a great thing to have gone to do that because it gave me the understanding that if you push yourself and leverage your strengths, you can achieve all sorts of stuff. You know, it's just amazing. Yeah. A any failures in there? Like, you know, it's easy to bring up the, 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 the successful examples, 
But as you kind of think about resiliency, it's about failing too. Any yeah. examples where you think like, yeah, I did all the things right and it's, st it still didn't work out and I had to come back around. Oh yeah. I, I, you know, the one thing that I really struggle with, with all my fantastic strengths is complete lack of patience. Mm. So for me, if, you know, I want to be better now, I want this to happen now. You know, I didn't realize actually that that uh, they never thought I would walk again. Um, and when they told me I could get up and walk, I practiced every day till I was back up on crutches. But the reality was five months in a wheelchair. Honestly, I'm sure I was just horrendous to be around unless I was working and distracted because I have no patience. It's just a virtue that has escaped me. And I think if ever, you know, the good Lord sends us here for a reason, I reckon I'll have many lives coming back to learn that one. So, yeah, that was a real devil for me. And it put me in uh, in, 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 in my strengths in their worst light sometimes. Uh, it's a good, I think it's a good example. We, we do these programs and sometimes we only highlight the great stuff and, and, mm -hmm. and don't realize, you know, in the, in my running years, it took the disastrous 20 mile practice runs to be able to run the full marathon, right? You had to go out and grind it through and the pain. And, and I think we, we just have to remember too, we got to fail through some of those moments where they're not going to all be successful. Not every situation is you going and singing and it, the crowd loves it. You have those moments uh, you know, kind of, we, we came close this morning. on just kind of like giving up on this, right. <laughs> giving up on this interview. Um, I told folks, I tricked the internet. I quit and the internet said, Oh, okay. And it stopped paying attention. And then we were able to get this thing through. Um, Lisa asked a great question and we spent a lot of time talking about you, but what kind of partnerships did you use in order to get through? How were, in, how important were the partnerships that you had? And maybe you can highlight one is you don't do this alone, right? Kind of takes folks to help pull this through. What kind of partnerships did you lean on? Oh, lots and lots and lots for different things. So, for example, I mean, I my empathy is really low. I, um, you know, um, I don't easily you know, feel sorry for people. I, I you know, I, I think sometimes I wish I could. I thought my my accident would make me feel more empathetic and understanding. In fact, it, it's it hasn't. It's made me recognize that, in fact, there's a lot we can do. Don't complain. It's terrible. Right. But I actually needed people around me who were empathetic. I needed a few people to hold my hand and tell me I was going to be OK and that, you know, they thought I was great. And they had friends who held my hand and rubbed my back. Yeah, I needed that sometimes. Um, I also really, um, you know, my, you know, my my husband has analytical and deliberative and um, achiever, and his his way of thinking is, what does she need? Oh, she needs ramps. We have a wheelchair, and she'll need this, that. So everything was a process, and he got ramps here and done this and done that. I needed that because without him, I wouldn't have got anywhere. Um, you know, I, I so I really, really look for people's different strengths from people. I mean, I needed people who also could help me say, come on, Laura, you've got this. You keep going, keep going. You've got the strengths. So I think that I it wasn't just one or two partnerships. I needed lots and I really wanted to be around people who who could lift me up in whatever format that was and also those wonderful relationship building people who just had my back that was just wonderful um any in as you think about the, well i i love the example that you bring up with your husband because it it becomes very practical at that point in other words sometimes there's just things that need to get done Right. It, it's great that like there's someone there to help me and emotionally and, you know, help me to smile. But sometimes the wheelchair just has to get in the door. Right. How important are those strategic partnerships in, you know, as we think about the work that you're doing and, and, and maybe it's not your husband, but maybe somebody you work with or, or somebody in organizations. How important were those relationships that actually helped you get things done? Oh, it was really important because, you know, when I even when I went back into into the workplace, for example, I was in a wheelchair for a long time. I did get back to work quite quickly. And and even when I came out, out of the wheelchair, I've spent the last eight years 
on and off crutches. Um, and my job has taken me around the world. So I'm on crutches on the plane. I've learned to go in the back entrance of an aeroplane. I thought at first I was going to be sitting in the hold next to the luggage. Uh, but I've got used to doing lots of different things. But I have recognized that, you know what? you can't always do things on your own i was always so independent and suddenly you realized but i need help mm. and i need to reach out and there are people who can help me in different ways whether it was strategically planning a trip that i had for me so that everything was in place that i needed or whether it was physically you know helping me you know, with my luggage or whether that, that you know there's all kinds of partnerships but the most important thing is that i recognized is that even if you think you've got it all covered and you're used to doing things for yourself it's hard to be vulnerable but there are times that we're actually all a lot more vulnerable i think than we possibly realize um and it's really important that we look for different opportunities, different partnerships, and how we can collaborate. And I actually probably have become more aware of options and people and what how we can elevate strengths together because I've had so many things over the years that I just haven't been able to manage on my own. And it's made me far, far more aware of, of how we can work together, whether it was in a team at work or through friendships or whatever it is. Um, and I think it's, you know, there are so many options that we do, but we don't always look. And I think one of our big failings is we're so busy doing, we don't always ask for help either. We just we don't always like to ask. Um, and yet it's so important and we can achieve so much more often um, if, if we if we do. Most people want to help. I find when I'm working with individuals and they say these key phrases that we've talked about here, I'm stressed or I'm angry. Uh, I want to avoid those. <laughs> like I, I immediately try to change the subject. I think what I'm learning from you through this our time together today is to to just stop for a second and say, what's going on? Like, yeah. what's happening? Like, just tell me, tell me more about that. Like, let's dig into this thing. Let's call it for what it is. It's kind of teaching me a little bit of like asking that question of, cause I, I just, I'm not naturally built that way. And yet I interview people for a living. Like that's what I do. Now it's a lot easier when we have this all set up and we have notes and everything's favorable. It's a lot harder. And you probably know this. It's a lot harder when, the person's really suffering and you're like, do I really want to ask these questions? Do I really want to open this up, you know, open this flower up? Cause I think it's beautiful on the inside. We're just afraid in that moment to go tell me more about it. Cause there's, there's a lot of fear um, in that. Jasmine asked a great question in the chat room and I want to get your opinion. Is patience connected or related to resilience? So as we think about this idea of patience, mm -hmm. Talk it. How, how do you see that? Or for you, you've admitted you're not very patient in that, right? Um, so how do you see? How do you see that? No, to me, uh, well, I mean, yes, there is there is a well, there is a degree, I guess, of patience in resilience. Um, as I said, it's not something that I have, but I I, I learned I'm really resilient. But I think. As I said to you, I'm, I'm, you know, resilience is a strategic process and it's figuring out what everyone's is different. Your journey is different. It depends what your strengths need to get you through. So you can learn. I, I studied positive psychology and I worked, uh, I, uh, you know, with uh, I worked on resilience and uh, learned optimism and there are a lot of strategies and I know the strategies, but at the end of the day, we can all know a strategy, but we need to be motivated to want to, to actually fulfill that. Um, you know, for example, you'll, you, you may find that sometimes, you know, there's that expression, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. So somebody's got to want to be motivated and that's where your strengths come in. You align them to where you're going. Um, and I think that if you do that, it makes you resilient. Everything's a choice. We have choices. We've got to make the choices. And yeah, is it easy? Not always. You know, I think when I think of um, every time now I have surgery or I have a problem, people say, oh, you must find it so quick to be resilient or, you, you know, you probably don't get upset anymore. I think, oh, seriously, when that thing hits you, it's like this, you know, I feel sometimes like I'm in a bowling alley. You know, that ball comes and poof, 
flatten to go and then you crawl back up and then the other one comes and back down so the thing is you still feel that awful ugh, but when you know the strategies and you practice and you know what works for you bit by bit by bit you can reach for them more i guess a little bit more quickly it's not a bounce it's never a bounce um but you know patience as i said are, it's never fast enough for me um, and that's my problem because maximizer wants to get back and have it better and best all the time yeah. um so yeah so i think that that, that no p patience is necessary but it's not the end of the world yeah no I, lo I love that look we got a bunch of questions coming in so let me let me throw these out ahead of you uh, so Megan asked, uh, to your point about forgetting to ask for help, what ways did you find asking for, for help was possible? What, what strategies, cause it's, sometimes it's hard for us to do that. How did you get better at it? Do you know what? I have to be quite frank and say, it's still something I'm not great at hmm. because I think that my, you know, my strengths happen to be very self-sufficient, very strong. I have self-assurance as well. So I'm always thinking, yeah, I've got it. I, you know, and I'm normally the one that when, you know, if anything happens, people would come to me and I can say, it's OK, I've got this covered for you. I'll sort you out. So I think when you're used to being very self-sufficient yourself and then you're in this place where you're suddenly very vulnerable, it's very hard to ask. Um, and I think, you know. It, yeah, I think I, I I started just little things, you know, would you mind helping me with this or I'm struggling with that? Could you, you know, are you able to offer assistance in? And, and I realised that people would, you know, of course. I mean, I think if anyone was to ask any of you, you'd all say if someone asked me for help, not at all, happy, happy to offer it. And yet when someone says, OK, then you ask for help then and we all say, yeah, no. I won't bother. Um, so we have to remember that people are willing to help. Most people want to help if they can. And so I think, you know, we have to remember that, put that in mind when we need something and think, you know, where do I need help? And I think if people can honestly see that generally you are trying so hard to help yourself, everybody's willing to try and get you there um you know but it's about finding the right people around you surrounding yourself by your tribe the people who you know help you and who you invest your time with um and and i think you just got to ask the question yeah i i think that's easier in a partnership just to be honest like when you have a really good partner and the partner can ask on your behalf that that like for me i'm terrible for asking for help but when my wife asks someone hey jim needs some help can you it's just it, it's just better it's just better that way so that's a, that's another that's just kind of a strategy that i use um kevin asks um it said that resilience is built through uh taking care of ourselves do you find that true if so how do you do that yeah, you have to. Do you know what? I was prior to my accident, uh, I used to run. I mean, there's probably some of you are probably far greater athletes than me. Um, but I used to run about 50 or 60 kilometers a week and I was boxing and training and, and, and I was fairly fit. And I have to say that the surgeons have told me because now, even now, they still say, you, you know, every x-ray we look at tells us you can't possibly be walking on those feet, let alone doing sport, because they're such a mess. But they did say that I'd survived the accident because I was fit. And I really, I, I really think that when we take care of ourselves, there's two parts, there's physical care and mental care. And I think the physical, the exercise is it is so important, you know, when I couldn't, even though I was completely smashed and broken, I, I started working out as soon as I could by moving my arms and trying to do eventually, you know, lifting hand weights and doing things to help lift my upper body. So I think, you know, if you're if you use exercise and whether you're a walker or a runner, whatever it is, that really, really helps physically to keep you strong, helps your body get together. And it does help you through things from a mental situation. Of course, we need to take care of ourselves. You know, we need to understand when we're feeling stressed because there comes that time when, you know, stress then becomes exceedingly adverse over a longer period of time. So we need to make sure that when we we recognize where our trigger points are and we have to recognize this is as much as I can do. What do I need 
what do I need again to be at my best? What what do I need? I need energized people around me. That mm-hmm. that always helps. Um, I might need time out on my own quietly. Um, I have friends with um, who need to just sit and have journaling time or yoga time or meditation. For me, I need exercise. I need people. I need to be surrounded by stuff and that helps me so it's really understanding what you need but that mental care is so important to keep us feeling confident and and in control uh, uh, and feeling that we're in the driving seat of where we're going lisa makes a point um she just said anyone else see the connection between the, between the dimensions of well-being and resilience and and absolutely lisa i mean i think as we Think of those five elements we've identified, and 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 it's not not necessarily exhaustive. There are others as well, but as we think, they're absolutely tight. If we're suffering in any of those elements of our well-being, that will excuse the phrase, but that will bleed through to how we're you know to kind of how we're feeling you know emotionally, and that that um that disrupts our resiliency. I think that to be able to bounce back um, from things. A couple more questions. Uh, Lisa also asks, um, uh, how does uh, she use this in her coaching and consulting now? Does she have a particular, do you have any particular exercises or practices that you recommend? Well, I think, you know, what I find really important is to try is to get to grips first with how people manage to get them to talk about what do they need when they feel frustrated. Because often, You know, I find a lot of the people that I work with are maybe at crossroads or at a difficult place in their life, but they actually haven't assessed what it is that they're really fundamentally upset about or what they're finding hard. Um, And and I think that because like all of us, we kind of gloss over the emotional bit. We kind of move, try to move on too quickly. So I think probably what I've learned to do is to really kind of deep dive into getting them to understand where they're really at right now. And it's only when you re- they really understand that. Then we talk about, well, what, what makes you feel good? What do you need? And most people don't think about what they need. I find that in life, we're so busy doing. We don't really think very much about what we need. We don't think about, um, you know, what, how to be our best. We, well, or let's say we do think about wanting to be our best, and we're constantly, but we're not really digging deep enough to think about who we are and what matters. So I think the thing is, when I'm coaching, I really kind of get back in that space first and figure out where, you know, what they really, really need and then say, okay, how do we build from there? So I think, you know, when I was working, for those of you who use uh, Cascade with releasing strengths, I was working a bit with Richard um, and, and we were just talking about this, that the thing is, is to try not to jump into the strengths aspect to too fast as to you know what strategies to leverage but to go back first and let them look at where their strengths sit in basement and and how how they're managing that before you can start moving them forwards and that's what I find I've had to do with a lot of people particularly you know in the last year and a half COVID has hit everyone mentally um, and people have lost a lot of confidence and I think when you lose confidence um, that that's where kind of our strengths all kind of go fizzle out and we think we can't do it so um, that's certainly something I found that I my clients have benefited from uh, your book pre or post the accident post so my book has been released uh, released in May I was delighted that it became an international bestseller um, I think it was because I'd really taken the accident and looked at how it was with things that were affecting me. And, you know, obviously I'd studied positive psychology. I worked at, at, you know, with Barbara under Barbara Friedrichsen at Penn University and learned about resilience and have really tried to marry, you know, what I was going through with some useful, hopefully, easy, easily readable and, uh, you know, things that people could use themselves in their own lives, you know, in terms of our thinking traps, optimism, you know, just building the right people around you, you know, and and how we cope. Because one thing I've recognised is that when we talk resilience, you know, for me, 
I've always thought of people, um, you know, Olympic people or Navy SEALs or people who kind of done amazing stuff. And I think, wow, my God, that's amazing what they've done. But that's them. I mean, if anyone had asked me before my accident, if I could cope the way I have, I would have said, yeah, not me. Um, but the thing is, we can. Um, but I think that we often don't think that we are able to do half the things we can do. So my book was really about explaining that I'm just, honestly, I'm just an average person. You know, I work, I'm a mom, I have dogs and cats and husband um, and kids, you know, and everything else and, and trying to juggle everything. And we can still do all these things, but it's just learning how. So that's where my book came from, is just really to help people connect in and say it is possible. Your book is Rebuilt to Last. And uh, I love the <laughs> rebuilt uh, in that. Do you do you feel like the rebuilding process for you as you've kind of put your body back together, has that also been an emotional rebuilding process for you and realizing I'm not going to be able to do the same things that I did. I'm not going to be able there. There obviously there are things you can't do today. Has that been an also an emotional rebuilding process? Oh yeah. <clears throat> the whole time. I mean, because every time you hit a low point, you know, you're still feeling challenged and you still think, I thought I'd, I was coping. I thought I'd nailed this and suddenly, oh, but I haven't. Um, and so it is, it's a constant, it's a constant evolving every single time it's evolving it's looking at ways i have to say one of my key uh, triggers still it shouldn't be but still is is the fact that i can't run anymore i, I will never be able to run and when i'm kind of walking I, I i have to be honest i can walk on crutches faster than a lot of people can jog but when i'm out there doing that and i see people kind of jogging past me saying oh well done rather than think proudly I think you shouldn't say that you should have seen me as a runner I was really good so I still struggle with this whole thing of not running and and that's really hard and I think it's something I'll always struggle with but there are things I can do um and you know I have to also face the fact that modern surgery is keeping me out of a wheelchair um I in the future it's possible I'll still face amputation um I think I've, I've, I've reconciled myself to the fact that for anyone who's listening, who's in a wheelchair for life, I seriously applaud you. You are stronger than I think I could be. Um, but I feel that for me, if I had to face that, I would rather have amputation and have some hoops and get myself going. But the thought of sitting for the rest of my life would just about, you know, finish me off. So I still have to face these things and they're still yeah. not easy decisions to make down the line. Yeah. It's not a, it's not a sitcom where it's over in 30 minutes, right? Yeah. I mean, you, you, you really have to kind of work up through you, you are dealing with this injury, you're recovering, it's COVID, you write a book. <laughs> how did that, ex like a lot of our coaches write books, right? How, how did you get, how did you push through all that to get the, to, well, you have focus obviously, but how'd you push through that to get that all done? Well, can I just go one step further and say, yeah. just prior to COVID, I decided to set up on my own as well, my own business. Uh, so yeah. I got all timing. But in fact, to be honest, it was great because it meant that I, I had to take time and I had to do things and build things more slowly. Um, but I I'd, I'd wanted to write the book for a while and i just felt you know i think anybody who's possibly listening whether you're you know if you are working for yourself you'll know what it's like if you've been in corporate as i had been for nearly 30 years and suddenly move out you suddenly realize that you who are well known within your corporate environment and with all your clients when you leave suddenly you're on your own mate and and your branding is not there anymore so you've got to rebrand yourself and you've got to rebuild yourself and you know this was the whole thing this is where my you know the rebuilders come in you know i've completely reinvented and built myself up and i've been so lucky that i've i've spent that time and and, and kind of you know been able to to do so many things so it was writing the book and i you know and doing so many so many things but that's my achiever and that's my focus, and that's my activator, and that's my maximizer. They've all been working really, really hard for me. Um, yeah. And I have to say I'm grateful for them. That's good. You, you lean into them for sure. I don't know necessarily if you have to have those things to get the book, to get those kind of things done. Certainly, 
that's what you've no well, everyone has their own strengths and yeah, to, to, right. but this is the one you know these are the strengths that i you know that worked yeah. for me to get me through it. but um yeah i was grateful uh, Laura, last question for you. If you were going to, as we kind of head out here, if you were to give coaches any more advice or any more encouragement or any final thoughts uh, on what you've learned, what, what would you give them here on the way out? I think probably, you know, for for yourself, if, if you, you know, we're as coaches, we're so good at looking at what other people, helping other people through is also, you know, when I'd learned for me that when this happened to me, I still wasn't deeply connected with who I was and what I needed because I was so used to being and doing for everybody else. So I would say, please take the time for yourself as well to know you and spend time on you care because you know what, you also need to look after you if you find yourself in this situation. And I think, you know, as far as working with um, with people, with groups or individuals is a reminder that, you know, when it comes to now where people still are not feeling very resilient, this world is not in, a, in that place yet, um, is, is a reminder that resilience is not a quick fix. It is a strategic process and it is about really going back to the basics of our emotions and our our kind of basement behaviors and hijacked you know feelings before we can start to move forwards and it's really about going right the way back first and looking at that before being able to put in the strategies and the structures to move people through on on, on their on how their students can help them i think i think very well said thank you for coming on today being a part of this thanks for having thank some resiliency in the process of getting this done this morning i woke up <laughs> With no internet at my house, we were completely down. And of course, then I had to, uh, you know, scramble to kind of race into the office and get some things set up. And then we had a little internet trouble uh, with you and getting things going. But thanks for just, a, I think, just an example of a little bit of re resiliency of saying, well, things are what they are. At one point, I think I'd even kind of given up. But we was like, well, no, maybe this will, maybe this will work. And I think just a, a micro example of of how we can uh, how we can kind of push through these things. And so, Laura, thanks for coming on. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. It's been lovely. Thank you, Jim. You are very welcome. With that, we'll remind everyone to take full advantage of all the resources we do have available now in Gallup Access. Head out to gallup.com slash Clifton Strengths, and you can sign in there. We've got a lot of stuff in the resource section menu, upper left. Drop it down, choose resources, just search for those there and uh and we got a lot of great stuff for you if you're interested in coaching master coaching or you want to become a gallup certified strengths coach you can always send us an email coaching at gallup.com if you uh this first time you've joined us for a live event and you're like and actually many stayed through even though we went over because of the delay uh many many um stayed over if you want to join us live for these head out to gallup.eventbrite.com and uh, follow us there and you'll get a notification whenever we push something new. Join us on any social platform by searching Clifton Strengths. And uh, we want to thank you for joining us today for this very important, and they're all important, but this very important webcast on resiliency. Appreciate you guys coming out and staying. Most <laughs> of you stayed through it as well. Thanks for coming out. With that, we'll say goodbye, everybody.